Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel, my friends. It is Star Trek, the original series day, and today's offering is season one, episode 23, A Taste of Armageddon. I mean, there's only so many times I can say I can't wait to see this, so I'll say it one more. I can't wait to see this. My friends, if you could do me a favor, hit that like button, smash that subscribe, ring the bell for notifications. You'll be alerted anytime we beam up to the Enterprise for any Star Trek The Original Series or Star Trek Lower Decks or The Expanse or any of our sci-fi offerings. And of course, if you'd like any of those early or in their full-length format, the link to the Patreon it's in the description, my friends. And of course, if you don't like Patreon, you can always join us over here on YouTube. You get the episodes about a day early and uh, a couple bonus episodes too, like my uh, soon to be released personnel files for Star Trek, the original series. But my friends, all that is then, and this is now. And what is now? Now is one of my favorite times of the week. Now it's time for Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode 23, A Taste of Armageddon. My friends, prepare to engage maximum warp reaction. And away we go. There's my beauty. Objective, to open diplomatic relations with the civilizations known to be there. Like first contact? Nothing yet, Lieutenant. Nothing, Captain. Oh. Hailing frequencies are open. Healing frequencies open. Oh. Nothing yet, Ambassador. We're awaiting a reply. Ambassador. Code 710 means under no circumstances are we to approach that planet. No circumstances whatsoever. You will disregard that signal, Captain. Mm. By disregarding Code 710, you might well involve us in an interplanetary war. I'm quite prepared to take that risk. You are. With my ship? I'm thinking about this ship. Yeah. You will proceed on course. That's a direct order. All right, Ambassador, then it's your ass. How's that sound? We run into any problems, I'm holding you personally responsible and I'm putting that in my log. In view of Code 710, Captain, may yes. I suggest... Yes, Mr. Spock. This is the Captain. Condition, yellow alert. Yeah. Reflector shields up. Yep. We're going in, gentlemen. Peacefully, I hope, but peacefully or not, we're going in. Oh, Jim's gonna tell us about the final frontier right here. I have said it once and I'll say it a million times, Jim, has absolutely no downtime. I mean, I'm sure he does. We don't see him sleeping and stuff like that. But I mean, it, it, it's, it's imperative decision after monumental decision after monumental decision. And he is always, I, I will say this too, I really like the dynamic of when there is somebody that supersedes his authority on the Enterprise because it, it confines him to a narrow range of responses that he's allowed to give. You know, like he can't really kind of bend and massage the rules like he might normally do um, just because he's got oversight. And I think that that is a really interesting dynamic because it um, again, it shows us a different facet of the leadership of James T. Kirk that he can he can follow orders. You know, he just uh, most of the time when he disagrees with them, uh, he's right. My orders are clear. No Sulu. It's always a bad sign when there's no Sulu. Their civilization is advanced. They've had space flight for several centuries, but they've never ventured beyond their own solar system. Okay, so it's a weird kind of first contact. The Earth expedition making the report failed to return from its mission. The USS Valiant. Valiant? I can't risk beaming you down there until I know what kind of reception you're going to receive. Your safety is my responsibility. Those are my orders, sir. Huh. Ship's defenses. Screens down. But all defensive details on general alert status, Captain. Yeah, screens have to be down for transport. Phaser number ones from the arsenal. Keep them inconspicuous. Type ones. Take care of her until I come back. Aye, aye, sir. And uh, have a bonny trip. <laughs> all right, Scott's got command. <laughs> the ambassador doesn't seem to like the fact that Scott's in command. I see the potential kiss of the week. Remember your instructions. They are to be treated correctly. Nothing more. Don't let them be off-put by your hats. All these two poor... There's three red shirts, everyone. Is this our yeoman of the week, I wonder? Because I saw her on the bridge, too. I'm Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise, representing the United Federation of Planets. I'm babbling. We've come directly to the Division of Control. If you'll follow me, please. Division of Control. Did she say her name was Mayor? A non seven and members of the High Council await you. If you will come this way, please. Okay. The 
hats or something else. Strong hat game here. This is my first officer, Mr. Spark. Lieutenants Galway, Osborne, Yeoman Tamarok. Welcome to Emilia 7. I will be your enemy this week. My mission is to establish diplomatic relations between your people and mine. That is impossible. No, thank you. <laughs> we have been at war for 500 years. Do you have diplomats? Sir, we have completely scanned your planet. We find it highly advanced, prosperous in a material sense, and peaceful in the extreme. Yet you say you are at war. Interesting. Casualties among our civilian population total from one to three million dead each year from direct enemy attack. What? With whom are you at war? The third planet in our system, called Vendikar. Originally settled by our people and now a ruthless enemy. Highly advanced technologically. Just like you all. Let's hear both sides of the story before we go demonizing Ventikar. Sir, my hat picked up an invasionary force. What is it? A hit right here in the city. You didn't hear anything. What the hell's going on? You hear any explosions, Mrs. None, Captain. Yeoman Tamara. Sir? Try quarter readings. Yep, she is a yeoman. I wonder if that was supposed to be Janice. I am reading The Longest Trek. Uh, Grace Lee Whitney's book. It's very sad. May I ask what weapons the enemy is using? Fusion bombs, materialized by the enemy over their targets. Fusion bombs? Anything unusual? Nothing, sir. All quiet. What the hell is going on? They were warned. Just as it happened 50 years ago. Alert a security detachment. For God's sakes, put your hat on. Computers, Captain. They fight their war with computers, totally. Yes, of course. Computers don't kill a half a million people. Deaths have been registered. Of course, they have 24 hours to report. To report? To our disintegration machines. You must understand, Captain. We have been at war for 500 years. What? I lost my wife in the last attack. Our civilization lives. The people die. And our culture goes on. This is lunacy. You're running a simulation and then actually... We have a high consciousness of duty, Captain. There is a certain scientific logic about it. I'm glad you approve. He doesn't approve. I do not approve. <laughs> yeah. I warned you not to come here. You chose to ignore my warning. I'm sorry, but it's happened. You've been killed. If possible, we shall spare your ship, Captain. But its passengers and crew are already dead. I mean... This is bizarre in the most beautiful way. Um, honestly, I've never seen anything like this except maybe in war games, but that was all theoretical. Your duty doesn't include stepping into a disintegrator and disappearing. I'm afraid mine does, Captain. I too have been declared a casualty. I must report to a disintegrator by noon tomorrow. What? If I refuse to report and others refuse, then Vandekar would have no choice but to launch real weapons. Physical war. You're assuming that Vendikar is actually going through with their theoretical disintegrations. It's been our way for almost 500 years. Time to change that way. Any moment, a flash on a computer screen could mean that half a million of is you are dead. Is there I can bring you? Yes. A non-7. I'm sure a non is never going to be part of the casualty updates. Let me take this off the door. Yeah, beauty. I tell you we should have heard something by now. I don't tell you that we should, but we haven't, and we can erase them. And I'm in the chair. You know, if there had been trouble, they should have at least managed to get word back to us. Well, we can't just sit here. What would you suggest? Does Bones have a tear in his... Scott here, Captain. Good news, Mr. Scott. The Amenians have agreed to the establishment of full normal diplomatic relations. Oh, this horse shit. Those are my orders, Mr. Scott. Aye, aye, Captain. We'll start forming shore parties immediately. Scott out. Very curious that he knew Scott's name. Run it through analyzer. Question. Is it or is it not the captain's voice? Negative. A close copy. A voice duplicator. 98% probability. How'd you suss that out, Scott? Are you sure you can do it, Mr. Spock? Limited telepathic abilities are inherent in Vulcanians, Captain. It may work. It may not. Very good, Spock. Kill everybody in this building. <laughs> I don't put I don't put that type of order. Or the, uh, the, the ability to, to carry that order out beyond Spock. Spock is absolutely 
the best officer Starfleet's ever seen. Oh, this is cool as hell. Is he gonna like pinch him from afar? That's cool. That's really cool. Do you got him? Oh, that is so cool. Oh, throat chop. Take that. We'll need more weapons. I understand. I am the weapon. It's easy, but if we're forced to kill. <laughs> Spock's like, done. <laughs> Spock's like, that's logical. We, we, we might have to actually uh, carve our way through this place. Oh, the color. RCA, love this shot. God, I love this show. The guy's just taking his hat for a walk. That's the running gag, everybody. I'm going to be talking about these hats all episode. That's the disintegrator. Holy shit. They're just walking in there. Impressive level of brainwashing. They go in, but they do not come out. A disintegration machine, so I would assume. Or, I wonder if they're actually being disintegrated. They sort of look like a transporter pad. What do you think you're doing? Uh, I'm, I'm going... You're not going in there. Well, I must. No, you're not. Please. All right, don't worry about me. Mr. Spock, that guard. Spock, kill them all. <laughs> The, the Nimoy strut is one of my favorite things ever. Sir, there's a mount legged creature crawling on your shoulder. It's my hand. Hi, everybody. Oh, what are you doing? Throwing a monkey wrench into the machinery. I can't be the only one they have if they have to do half a million people. Federation prisoners have escaped. They ought to be found. They are armed. They resist. Do what is necessary. Put on your kill hats. Calculate orbit of star cruiser now circling. Stand by to fire full power. It'd be interesting to know. I mean, they've never had to use physical weapons. In 10 seconds, open fire. Destroy the star cruiser. You know what sucks is this civilization's advanced enough where you can't just muscle them out of the way with the Enterprise. Not too big for the Enterprise to handle if it has to. We can't fire um, full phasers with our screens up, and we can't lower our screens with their disruptors on us. Of course, I could. Oh, I forgot about this asshole. Obviously, it's a misunderstanding, and one of my jobs is to clear up misunderstandings. They're holding our captain. All right, dickhead, get down there then. If you check your regulations, you'll find that my orders get priority. I'll try to make contact with the planetary officials. Yes, I think you should go down there, Mr. Fox. Mr. Spock, how did that little raid work out? We captured four of their disruptor-type weapons, two complete outfits of male clothing, and perhaps most important of all... Hats. ...the communication devices. <laughs> what are you going to do? We're going to try and stop the killing. We're gonna end this shit. I believe you, but... Tell me what I want to know. <laughs> That's that seduction he wields so well. Mr. Anon, this is Robert Fox. Special Ambassador. United Federation of Planets. A great honor, Mr. Ambassador. All right, Bob, what do you got? The minute their screens are down, open fire. Yes, Council. I apologize deeply for the misunderstanding. I look forward to seeing you. Diplomacy, gentlemen, should be a job uh, left to diplomats. Ah, or the arrogant. Assume a peaceful status. No, sir. I will not. What did you say? You heard me, dickhead. My authority. I know about your authority, but the screens stay up. I won't lower the screens. Your refusal to comply with my orders has endangered the entire success of this mission. Your arrogance has compromised it further. Your name will figure prominently in my report to the Federation Central. And your name will figure prominently uh, at the end of the sentence that I start with, fuck you. Well, Scotty, now you've done it. Hi. <laughs> Boat, so of you, dude. That mealy mouthed gentleman down below. Not until I know what happened to the captain. Montgomery, thank God you have a spine, buddy. 
Uh, Bones is such a fucking flip flopper too. Won't you join me in a drink, Captain? No, asshole, I won't. Where's my communicator? I assume that is what you use to destroy disintegration chamber number twelve. A very efficient weapon. I'm not afraid of using it. My first impression was correct. So was mine. You are a barbarian. And you're an arrogant prick. Of course you are. We all are. A killer first, a builder second. A hunter, a warrior, and let's be honest, a murderer. <laughs> I'm trying to save a world. If I were you, I'd think about saving my life. Don't you have a drink, Captain? Now I can get this information from somebody else. You don't seem to realize the risk you're taking. We don't make war with computers and herd the casualties into suicide stations. We make real war. The real thing. <laughs> I had no idea you were so formidable. You seem to think I'm joking. Where are the communicators? Come on, Anon. They're in the war. Go left, down the corridor, left again. You're coming with me. Are you serious? Yeah. You're coming too, dude. That hat doesn't save you from a neck chop. Look at Jim go. I should look at Bill go. Come on, Bill. Good choreography, good fight sequence. It's I, Ambassador Fox, and my assistant, Sly. I am Robert Fox. Have I the honor of addressing Anon Seven? Welcome to Emenia, Mr. Ambassador. Where is Captain Kirk? You promised him uh, here at my arrival. You have broken your promise six like, tenths of a second into my arrival. We are to be killed? That is correct, Mr. Ambassador. I regret it very much. There is nothing I can do about it. Well, have fun. See ya, Bob. Spock to Enterprise, come in. Come on, Ohoro. It's Mr. Spock. There we go. Orbit out to maximum phaser range and stand by for further orders. Spock out. We want orbital bombardment on Anon Seven's house. You stay here and prevent this young lady from immolating herself. Knock her down and sit on her if necessary. This is a killing situation. Do what you must to protect yourself. It's a killing situation. I love it. What are you doing, Mr. Spock? Practicing a peculiar variety of diplomacy, sir. Spock is the best. Then I must find the captain. They have him. The guards told us. They took him to the council room under heavy guard. Spock, I've messed everything up. I like how most of the citizenry is just like, they flee, which is exactly the way it should be because they're not used to physical confrontation to our disintegration chambers. It is a violation of an agreement that dates back 500 years. Tough shit. Millions of people horribly killed. Complete destruction of our culture here, yes, and the culture on Vendikar. Disaster, disease, starvation, horrible, lingering death, pain and anguish. That seems to frighten you. It would frighten any sane man. You are certainly not that. We have done away with all that. Now you are threatening to bring it down on us again. Why don't you do away with the stupid war? This is the USS Enterprise. Study! General Order 24, two hours. In two hours! Enterprise, this is Anon 7. First councilman of the High Council of Iminyar. Means nothing to me. Unless you immediately start transportation of all personnel aboard your ship to the surface. The hostages will be killed. In two hours. The Enterprise will destroy Emini R7. Planetary defense system. Open fire on the Enterprise. I'm sorry, Councilman. The target has moved out of range. Ooh! A step ahead. Anon. You wouldn't do this. <laughs> I didn't start it, Councilman. But I'm liable to finish it. <laughs> oh, Jim. Oh, Sly caught astray. What I want or don't want has nothing to do with it. Escalation is automatic. You can stop it. Stop it. I'm counting on it. Oh. 
You all need to stop using the theoretical fighting and maybe, you know, go to the gym a little bit. I assumed you needed help. Nah. See, I'm an error. <laughs> oh, I need the help. Spock and Kirk. What a team. Kirk to Enterprise. Come in, Scotty. Aye, Captain. Are you all right? Is it really you? Destruction, disease, horror. That's what war is all about. And on. That's why people stop it. That's what makes it a thing to be avoided. I'm going to end it for you, one time, way or another. Time to start a real war. Come with me. Mr. Osborne? Are the red shirts actually going to make it? Get effed. Welcome to real war. I want the realization to be that, what is it, the Venta, Ventacar has not been killing their people. <laughs> They haven't. They figured out a workaround. We can admit that we're killers, but we're not going to kill today. That's all it takes. Knowing that we're not going to kill today. And you just say that every day. I think you'll find that they're just as terrified, appalled, horrified as you are. That they'll do anything to avoid the alternative I've given you. Peace or utter destruction. It's a hell of a, hell of a gamble, Jim. I should be glad to offer my services as negotiator between you and Vendy Carr. The insanity of this episode is what makes it brilliant. Chance it may work, Captain. Spock, who gives a shit? Let's get out of here. Cancel implementation, General Order 24. Alert transporter room. We're ready to beam up. So General Order 24 is a thing. Kill them all, is that what it is? I had a feeling that they would do anything to avoid it, even talk peace. Feeling is not much to go on. It's everything. Captain, you almost make me believe in luck. Why, Mr. Spock? You almost make me believe in miracles. Oh, they're becoming such friends. I love it. All right, my friends, we just got done watching Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode 23, A Taste of Armageddon. And the only thing that we have left to do is to talk about it. All right, friends, just got done watching Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode 23, A Taste of Armageddon. This was a very interesting uh, episode. It was a little, for me, it was a little... Um, it was one of those episodes that you watch that frustrates you uh, in, in the best possible way. It's because it's not frustrating because you don't agree or you don't like the episode. It's frustrating because of the circumstances and their inability to be resolved quickly. <laughs> you know, obviously you don't want a 15 minute episode, so we've got to stretch it out a bit. But um, really, really cool stuff here. Really, really cool premise in that, you know, the evolution of war. And this is certainly something that we could see, you know, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that this is the way that war could be conducted, you know, um, where it's like, hey, we don't want to destroy infrastructure, but we want to, you know, it's almost like a it's almost like a digital version of chemical warfare. You know, originally chemical warfare was used so infrastructure wouldn't be destroyed of a city. You know, you drop a chemical bomb and it kills all the humans and then you've still got the city you know that type of uh, understanding you could see the evolution of that becoming a digital version of that where it's like oh hey you know we scored 500,000 casualties so you do that and oh you got us for 430,000 casualties we'll do that um I mean it sounds bizarre it sounds like absolute lunacy but at the same time you can understand that there is a possibility it's not outside the realm of possibility that a certain culture could evolve into this, you know, that so desperately wanted to keep their society and every, the status quo, I guess. It's cool to, and you know what, I, I liked it. I liked the, the idea that Ambassador Fox was a huge prick because I am, I always liked the idea of having Kirk superseded. I really liked when uh, Montgomery Scott stood up to Fox. That was a great idea. That was a great moment where he, he was willing to, Scotty's willing to, you know, for the, it shows his commitment to the Enterprise, both the ship and the crew. You know, he could be court-martialed. He could be thrown into prison. You know, like they said, a penal colony. Scotty was like, you know, hey man, fuck it. If, if that's the, what it takes for me to keep this ship safe for the next 30 minutes, hour, day, I'm going to do it, you know? My life or my freedom isn't worth the sacrifice of the Enterprise and her crew. I mean, that's. I mean, what else can you expect from a Starfleet officer, especially one of Scotty's standing? You know, you've, uh, you expect it, but you are rewarded in its delivery. You know, you sure you can expect everybody on the crew to act that way, 
but the real reward is actually seeing them act that way. You know, watching their actions portray the same tenets that we feel is already kind of inherent in their personality. Really great stuff, you know. Um, and again, we down on the planet, you know, they had to stretch it a little bit. And I think that that's, it created a, a little bit of a, a lag towards the middle of the episode. But at the same time, it wasn't noticeable where it got boring or anything like that. It was just, I think they were struggling to figure out exactly, like, uh, as far as the story goes, they were struggling to figure out, like, another, there should have been, like, another problem. You know what I mean? Like, there should have been something else that they had to supersede, like, escape from somewhere or... But, um, you know, it was a lot of the kind of the same thing. Run to a disintegrator, save somebody, blow up the disintegrator. We did that like twice, which is fine. That's it's not it's certainly like I said, I'm nitpicky when I'm coming. You know, I'm, I'm nitpicky when I'm I, approaching and coming to each of these episodes to see, you know, they're so good. And when you've got like a balance of terror, which for me is like the best one I've seen so far, when you've got that, you have to compare all the other ones that precede and uh, come after it as, you know, kind of that's that's our high water mark you know where do we go and it's 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 healthy to look at some of the shortcomings of the episodes uh without you know this is still in my opinion an above average episode because it's subject matter and the story was so unique you know it, it was a really what if we found a warring species that dealt with a completely different arsenal than what we were expecting what's the arsenal it's in the mind. It's in a computer. It's a tactical simulation that we reward the tactical advantages, you know, uh, successes and failures with real world casualties. That is a crazy, interesting, you know, scenario. And I thought it was really well done. Um, I think that the acting was very good, too. I think that uh, Fox was uh, pretty good. Fox was pretty good. But um, it was a non seven who I thought really did, you know, really sold the crazy and really sold the, uh, you know, the delivery and the passion behind what this world really was. You know, he believed it completely. Like he believed completely that, you know, this was the way it should be. It, it was it was a very believable performance for somebody that had lived under this rule and not only lived under these tenets, this agreement, you know, this 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 digital war, but the society had done so for 500 years. Now, again, they didn't tell us how long lived uh, the people were, but at the same time, we assume it's probably like human standard. So there have been generations born and died under this umbrella. And I'm sure the farther that they got away from actual physical conflict, the more accepting they were of the way that this is how it would go down. We're at war. This is this is their version of war. You know, there's there's they don't know about, you know, the actual physical destruction of a planet or a city or, you know, all of these things. So this is how what they've come to accept. And it was believable in that respect. It was absolutely something that you could see happening, which is that's it for me. When somebody comes up with an episode of Star Trek, if you can make it believable at first, like, oh, man, somebody could act this way or somebody could do this or technology could go this way, that goes 90% of the way for making it a great episode because you're already accepting the premise. Now, uh, what we saw, too, from everybody else, you know, it, and like because the premise is really the, the subject of the story here, there isn't too, too much to go into outside of the uniqueness of this, the, the, the you know, the treatment of the story. You know, here's the broad strokes. The broad strokes is the story for this one. What do we get to see from our uh, beloved crew? Well, we, we already talked about Scotty being able to stand up. Um, I always love how Bones is written so chaotically, where he supports Scotty one second, and as soon as Fox leaves, he's like, what are you doing, Scott? You know, <laughs> pick a side, Bones. I mean, Bones just needs to be emotional and just needs to be, like, uh, argumentative for argumentative sake. And sometimes that's annoying, but whatever. You know, Bones is probably the character that I'm most surprised that I don't love because I really liked him in the movies. And um, I, I don't hate Bones. I just, I don't know how to feel about Bones because now that I see more of him, there are times I absolutely adore him and times where I could absolutely, you know, knock him out <laughs> if I was close to him, you know, and he was given this kind of constant barrage of arguments. But that's that. Of course, we got to see Spock be a badass again. That's Spock's default state is badassery. Being set down there on the planet, being, you know, uh, as part of the away team, he's the one that solves the problems, especially like the technical aspects of the problems. He's always supportive of the captain um, unless, you know, I mean, he'll disagree or kind of add to or augment uh, a general plan. But, you know, Spock is 
the absolute best person to bring anywhere for anything at any time. <laughs> He's, he is the Swiss army knife of the Federation. You know, he is an absolutely uh, integral part to any away team or shore party. You know, it's, it's ah, just the greatest, just the greatest. Red shirts didn't die. I love seeing that. I love seeing red, red shirt survival. And it might have something to do with the fact that they went and got those, those hats. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, the more I was fascinated by the hats, the more I realized that they look like swim caps with the added part on the top because they're very, they're very like swim cappy like on the sides. You know, hey, tip of the cat to the co uh, tip of the cat, tip of the cap to the uh, costume designer there because those were very interesting um, little set pieces for each individual of that society. I I, I, I enjoyed it as I did the uh, like bi-colored legs of certain of certain overalls. We have tan and black. It was kind of off-putting visually, but I loved it. I love the idea. Of course, we get to see Jim um, do his thing. Now, this one, I will say, when Jim has used kind of like his tactical, emotional side in the past, um, you know, kind of tempered with seduction. You know, I think of Conscience of the King when he was getting close to kind of figure out exactly what was going on. You know, he wields that as he wields any type of uh, persuasive element of his, you know, position of his, just his charisma. You know, seduction's part of it. And he did a bit in this one. But um, with this one, you know, this is the first time we've actually got to see, maybe not the first time, but, you know, Kirk's a little loosey-goosey when it comes to what he thinks is going to happen. And I think this was the biggest stretch that he took as far as how things would be realized. Um, you know, he was, it was a lot of speculation going on that, you know, if the computers went down, then they'd be forced to negotiate because they, they weren't ready for real war. Okay. You know, a couple things could have happened there that maybe Kirk was unaware of. The computers go down and, you know, ancient weaponry comes alive and, you know, missiles start flying back and forth across the planets. You know, you don't know. There could have been a fail safes to keep this type of uh, non-bloody war ongoing, you know, in case that this would fall or... You know, so he took a he had he didn't have a lot of background information for the leap that he took in, you know, what his tactical, you know, summation would be or his his conclusion for how he was going to address this problem. Um, it worked out, I guess, in that they had, you know, uh, they were beginning deliberations. But boy, oh boy, you know, that is a real, real stretch, because if he had gone the other way or gone that had gone poorly, you know, you could have the destruction of two planets on your hands. And uh, with Fox there, you know, you're not sure exactly how Ambassador Fox is going to go, even though he could have said, hey, you know, they started being aggressive and captured, and but, you know, Kirk led to the destruction of two planets. That doesn't look great on the old personnel file. But it's Kirk, and it worked out this time. I'm wondering, um, I look forward to the day where he has a, a less successful go of it, because I'd like to see how Jim reacts in that situation. I've never seen Jim Kirk one time. And this is because, you know, I started my uh, experience with the movies and Wrath. I've never seen the motion picture, um, but I've seen all the other original series movies from Wrath of Khan forward. Wrath of Khan, I've seen a lot. The rest of them I've seen like once, maybe twice with The Voyage Home. Um, but the only time I've ever seen Kirk lose was at the end of Wrath of Khan. And I'm wondering if that is the first time he ever loses. Because so far, you know, where some of his successes may be muted in the, in the original series and not maybe as, as wildly successful as some of his other ventures, I've never seen him, like, truly fail. You know, truly have a, like, a zeroed-out return. And... Um, I just keep thinking, is was that the first time? Was that the Kobayashi Maru that he couldn't doctor, you know, in Wrath of Khan? And uh, wow, I, I'm really actually, I have made it a point that I haven't watched Wrath of Khan for several years. And when I started this, I'm like, I'm definitely not going to watch Wrath of Khan until I sort of get to it in the timeline. I'm really looking forward to that now because I think I'm going to go into it with a, a brand new perspective, a brand new understanding, a brand new set of eyes 
I can't wait to, to watch it with the context of the original series kind of supporting the decisions that are made. I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I'll agree with it as much. Maybe I'll look at it and be like, mm, that's not how so-and-so would have acted according to the entire original series. I don't know, but I'm very interested to see how that happens. My friends, if you've stuck with me this long, do me a favor, hit that like button, smash that subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and you'll be alerted anytime we go live on YouTube with any original series, any lower decks, any expanse, any of our sci-fi related properties, you will be made aware. And of course, if you'd like those early or in their full length format, the link to the Patreons in the description. And if you hate Patreon, our YouTube memberships are live. You get the episodes 24 hours early and any bonus episodes like Star Trek original series personnel files that'll be starting up soon, you'll get those as well. But my friends, all that is then and this is now. And now I have some lingering questions about A Taste of Armageddon. I'd really like to know more about it, but I can't figure it out without ruining anything for me. So I have to defer to the only being that would know how to tell me about this show. Q. Greetings, mon capitans, and welcome to another installment of Q&A. Friends, this is where, after having watched an original episode, I like to go and explore it a bit further, find out little tricks and little trivia from behind the scenes that would have ruined it for me before the reaction. What I like to do to further kind of drill down and focus on these particular instances is to give us five categories in which to explore. These five categories are who were our writer and director, who were our guest stars, who of the core cast appeared, what certain production notes do we have, and for number five, if there are no syndication cuts, a memorable quote from the episode. Friends, let's get into it. All right, for our first section, who are our writers and who are our directors? Our writer of this episode is a two-parter. We have Robert Hamner and Gene L. Kuhn. Each of these I contributed to both the teleplay and the script that was written. I have become, this is not a universal statement, but I think that a lot of times when you see co-writers, you know, if you see so-and-so in teleplay by, you know, script by, written by so-and-so and teleplay by so-and-so, what I've found that to normally mean is whoever originally wrote the script, by the time they got around to production months or maybe even a year later, even more, that person wasn't really available for rewrites or for further fleshing out or punching up. And that usually fell to either Roddenberry, but more likely Gene L. Kuhn and often DC Fontana. So it was whenever we see those multiple names, I'm starting to think that this is what the, the norm is. The original writer is unavailable. And so kind of like the, the staff writers at that point pick it up and flesh it out and punch it up. Now, for our director, we have none other than Joseph Pevney, who we've met before in Return of the Archons and Arena, this marking the third directorial effort by Joseph Pevney. And now, my friends, for our next section, our guest stars. Who guest starred in this episode of Star Trek, the original series? Well, David Opatashu was a non-seven, and we'll have a little bit more to say about him when we get down to production notes. But in addition to David, we also had Gene Lyons, who played Bobby Fox, our wonderfully non-prickish ambassador. <laughs> And um, the last but certainly not least, Barbara Babcock played Maya Seven. Um, a couple, I, I, again, I got a little thing spoiled for me in that she does make a future appearance in Star Trek the original series as well. Um, but we've actually heard her before in the ones that we've reviewed and reacted to. She was the uncredited voice of Trelane's mom. And so I think that is wonderful that we have experienced Barbara before, especially as uh, the Q-like entity that was the family unit of Trelane, General Trelane, retired. Now for our core cast, who did we have of the big six? Again, the big six being Kirk, Spock, who most always are there, Bones, Scotty, Uhura, and Sulu. Everyone was present except for Sulu. And normally we can tell now, and I'm, again, this is another one of the things that as I'm reading and exploring, you can begin to see kind of a pattern to this. Anytime that Sulu is out uh, or George Takei is out, if the actual Helms person has lines, those were normally reserved for George Takei, but because George Takei had something else going on, he wasn't able to be there, those lines were gifted then to the whoever was sitting in the chair. And so we did have lines today from DeSau, I believe, is the, the uh, Helms person, Helmsman's name. But um, those were originally for Sulu. But unfortunately, George couldn't make it to this one. 
Now, my friends, for our production notes, who did we have or what did we, what happened behind the scenes? And I've said it once and I'll say it a million times. The story behind the cameras of Star Trek is every bit as fascinating as the tales told in front of the camera. So what little bits and bobs did we find out about this particular episode, A Taste of Armageddon? Well, Anand Seven, David Opatashu, was also up for the role of Dr. Boyce in The Cage. And you know what? You can see it. You really can because um, I thought Dr. Boyce was really good. I forget the actor's name that, that portrayed him in The Cage, but I thought he was really solid. But again, you can see David Opatashu doing that as well. You know, he, he has that kind of same almost delivery in a way. Now, a couple other production notes that we had. Uh, the sonic disruptors that were used in this episode become our Klingon and Romulan disruptors going forward. Uh, the Klingon uh, disruptors and the Romulan disruptors are the same weapons, but they have different bits that they put onto them to kind of make them unique unto the culture in which they're fitting, whether it be Klingon or Romulan, they have different kind of exterior outfits they attach to these weapons. But I thought it was kind of cool that, you know, we get to see this now as the evolution of these species, Romulan, Klingon, you know, where their origins come from. And the Disruptor is a, a pretty iconic kind of implement or weapon that they have. And the idea that this is the first time we saw the actual physical, for the Klingons anyway, the actual physical uh, Disruptors, it was really, really neat. Now, we did have a bit of a canonical snafu in this episode, and I'm sure, you know, a couple people picked up on this. Um, I, I didn't miss it, but I didn't address it during the reaction. I had a question about it that I never put into my thoughts section. But here's the question. You know, uh, Anon7 said, hey, if this happens, if they, as soon as they drop their screens to send down Ambassador Fox, blow them out of the sky. All right, well... And, you know, Ambassador Fox and his assistant Sly <laughs> make it down there uh, without there being a destruction or an attack on the Enterprise. So, you know, could it be explained that they timed it, dropped the screens, sent them out, and maybe kept it a – maybe their transporters had a farther range than the, 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 like the, the global weapon systems because we did know that they were out of range at one point. So – but they never explained it. And so in and of that, that was something else. And also another canonical problem in this – Scotty says that uh, they are unable to fire the phasers while their screens are up. And we know, you know, from the future that that's not a problem. In fact, it would be a terrible problem if you had to lower your defenses every time you wanted to attack. So in the future, when screens or shields are up, phasers and photons can be fired. And now this one I thought was really, really neat because as, as I mentioned, I've seen most of the movies and Star Trek Generations is one that I have seen. And in Star Trek Generations, though it is not actually mentioned, but you can see it, the sister ship of the SS LeCool was the SS Robert Fox, named after good old Bobby. And last but certainly not least, and this is one that I would uh, ask all of you that if you know of the definitive answer, are they ever kind of, uh, somebody somewhere uh, gave like, like an official statement on this, I would love to hear it because debate rages, and I looked at three different sources for this one, debate rages as to whether or not General Order 24 is a thing. A lot of people, one side of the argument says, no, 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 that was a complete bluff by Kirk. There is no General Order 24. However, and I don't know this, I don't have this type of information, but somebody said that another captain at another time issued General Order 24, and it's the same order, destruction to the planet, complete and utter destruction to the planet, but that one wasn't carried out either. So everyone said, well, you know what, General Order 24 is probably understood to be the destruction of a planet, but it's also a bluff that the Federation put in there to like keep everybody on their toes and kind of secret code between you know personnel. But that's never been the official statement. And ne to my what I've found, um, and many people haven't been able to definitively say whether or not General Order 24 is a real thing as stated, the destruction of a planet. Friends, if you know or can point me in the right direction, I would love to know whether or not that's real. And last but certainly not least, my friends, we have, as there are no syndication cuts mentioned for Taste of Armageddon, we do have a quote. And again, as I almost always default to, this quote is between Kirk and Spock. It is the very end of our outro for the episode where Spock says to Kirk, Captain, you almost make me believe in luck. And Kirk responds, why, Mr. Spock, you almost make me believe in miracles. I don't think anything 
can sum up the way that those two look at each other than that statement. Spock looks at Kirk and logic aside can only think the only way this guy gets away with what he gets away with has to be luck. And on the other side, Kirk looks at Spock and thinks the only way that this guy can do what he does has to be a miracle. But friends, thus ends another installment of Q&A. Until next time we meet, behave.